Let me read to you a passage from the first chapter of St. John's Gospel, verses 35 to 42. It's the Gospel for Wednesday before the Epiphany. St. John writes, John was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard what he said and followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following him and said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, was one of the two who heard John and followed Jesus. He first found his own brother Simon and told him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated Christ. Then he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You will be called Cephas, which translated is Peter. That's from John chapter 1, verse 35 to 42. We are led to think of the Lamb of God. What do I mean? There cannot be any doubt that in the Gospel of St. John, the figure and testimony of John the Baptist is of great significance. In the very prologue of the Gospel, he is introduced as one sent by God to bear witness to the light that is the Word, in order that all might believe through him. Chapter 1, verse 7. John the Evangelist believed through him. It is considered that John was one of the Baptist's two disciples who followed Jesus. The Baptist's testimony to Jesus was remarkable. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He ranks before me. I saw the Spirit descend as a dove from heaven, and it remained on him. This is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And this is the Son of God. John chapter 1 verse 29 to 34. We read that the next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples. He saw Jesus as he walked by and repeated once again, Behold the Lamb of God. This title appears in one gospel only, that of St. John, and again in the book of Revelation. We may take it that it derives from the prophecy understood as the announcement of a revelation received by a prophet of the Baptist about Jesus. But perhaps the Baptist drew on themes and passages from the scriptures. For instance, there is the event in the life of Abraham, which was an occasion of God's renewed promise to bless him. And by your descendants shall all the nations bless themselves. Genesis chapter 22. God had ordered Abraham to take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and offer him there as a burnt offering. Chapter 22, verse 2. Abraham obeyed God immediately, and as he made his way to the mountain, he, without realizing it, made a very significant prophecy. Isaac said to his father, Where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide himself with a lamb for a burnt offering, my son. Chapter 22, verse 7 to 8. God will provide the lamb. There would be a lamb of God for an offering. And there is a further prophecy of Abraham. On the Mount of Moriah, he had been commanded to offer this sacrifice. Chapter 22, verse 2. After he offered the ram provided by the angel, he called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Chapter 22, verse 14. In the fullness of time, centuries later, the Lord God provided his lamb for a sacrifice, and it was on the mountain of Moriah at Jerusalem. But there were other foreshadowings of the coming lamb. The lamb of God is dramatically featured in, Je in Exodus chapter 12 and 13, with the Jewish feast of the Passover. God orders Moses to tell all of Israel that they are to take a lamb, every man according to their father's houses. 
The lamb was to be without blemish, and it was to be slain and completely consumed. Its blood was to be on the house of every one of the children of Israel, and the one showing this blood would be spared by the angel of death. The angel would pass over that person and family. Exodus chapter 12, verse 1 to 13. This was to be a constant memorial, an annual feast on the 14th day of this month. Exodus chapter 12, verse 6. Nisan, the month of Nisan, in which the lamb would be sacrificed. Over a millennium later, God provided this lamb for sacrifice. Its blood, the blood consumed by those who followed the lamb, would be man's salvation. Did John the Baptist think of the Paschal Lamb? We do not know. But we may regard the words of John as a divinely inspired prophecy that fulfilled the hints of the scriptures long before. But then, of course, there is the Lamb who features in the Deutero-Isaiah prophecies of the man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole, and with his stripes we are healed. To what does the prophet liken this figure on whom the Lord has laid the iniquity of us all? He is like a lamb. We read, he is like a lamb that before its shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Breathtakingly, he makes himself an offering for sin, and he shall bear their iniquities. He bore the sin, the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7 to 12. Whoever has claimed such a mission, it was Jesus Christ, whom John called the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. All of this brings us to our gospel passage today, from John chapter 1, verse 35 to 42, in which John points to Jesus as the Lamb of God. He is encouraging his two disciples, perhaps his favourite and most promising ones, to follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Revelation chapter 14, verse 4. And this they did. Jesus turned and saw them following him and said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and you will see. What they did, we are called to do. To the whole world, the church says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Let us listen to the prophetic voice of the church and follow Jesus Christ, accepting his invitation to come and stay with him. Where does he stay? He stays with his spouse, his mystical spouse, the church. There he stays, from there he speaks to us, and there, in the sacraments, he gives himself to us. Thus do we come to live his divine life, and go forth each day to say to all, as did Andrew to Peter, we have found the Messiah.